So we are very excited to have Tom de Grieve as our next speaker. Uh, Tom is an associate professor of synthetic biology at Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, he's won a, a number of awards and, and grants, in particular the, the very prestigious ERC starting grant and the Crumb Lane Peterson Prize. Uh, and we will talk about um, communication between synthetic cells to us, which is very, very exciting. So, please, Tom. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. So, it's very exciting to be here. Um, I mostly give uh, um, presentations at more experimental conferences, so uh, I really like this and I, I really hope to get input. So, so, so basically, I'm interested in my lab in, in um, building what we call uh, lifelike chemical systems. So these are chemical systems, basically dead, uh, so they're not alive, they're not cells, but they do have properties uh, that we associate with uh, living systems. And what I want to do today is uh, give you some overview. I probably have way too many slides, so, so just cut me off at some point. Um, and this is a project where we, that we started a couple of years ago with the goal of developing a, a purely chemical system that can uh, do molecular communication. So basically between uh, semi-permal co compartments. Uh, so you're probably all, all aware that the uh, living cells, they communicate with each other and they, they do that by secreting uh, messengers. And these uh, messengers are uh, then uh, sensed by uh, neighboring cells, basically taken up, and then there's a, a, a response. And, and the reason that cells do that is that, uh, it, allow that it allows them, this collective information processum, uh, processing allows them to solve increasingly, increasingly complex tasks. Uh, you see that actually in all kingdoms of life are very simple, uh, simple organisms to, to mammalian cells, they, they all communicate. Uh, so the movie that you've shown in the background, you've probably seen it a lot. Uh, it's really one of my favorite movies, it's Dictostelium, it's a social amoeba. So it's normally present as a single cell organism, uh, but at the, then as, as the food sources uh, in the environment is depleted, some of these cells starts to send out cyclic AMP, and that actually triggers the fusion of these single cells into a, uh, into a higher order organism. Um, we're still very much, very, 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 very far away uh, from that, of course. Uh, but I just want to give you a, a slight brief overview of, uh, of the field and just discuss uh, two recent papers uh, where also other people developed uh, what we call protocell or basic abiotic uh, communication platforms. Uh, so, uh, so here on the left, you see a, a paper from uh, 2017. It's from, the, from Kate Adamala and uh, Ed Boyden. Um, and uh, it's uh, what they call the SINEL technology. Uh, so basically SINEL technology are liposomes that are filled with cell lysate. Uh, so these cell lysate, they can express genes. And what they could actually achieve is one-way communication from one liposome to another. So what they could do is to give, they give the liposome an input. Uh, the liposome started to produce this, uh, uh, this pore protein. And as a result, another messenger leaked out and that could activate the second population. Uh, so they could really show one-way communication between two liposome populations. Uh, here on the right is another example uh, from the group of Yannick Rondelet. Um, and uh, he took a slightly different approach. Um, he used beads, and these beads are decorated with uh, uh, pieces of DNA, uh, DNA strands. And uh, by doing chemistry on these DNA strands, a kind of PCR, uh, let's say, you could actually um, let these beads send out DNA signals from one bead to the other and back. And you could also follow that uh, in time. And you can actually, you could show that, that you can get actually two-way communication. So he showed that one bead can send a DNA strand to one uh, other bead and the other bead, that bead could send a, a signal back. Um, beads are very nice, uh, but if you think about uh, life, uh, our cells are not made of beads. Uh, we have membranes. Um, so actually, when, when uh, Yannick started this uh, around 2015, uh, we were actually thinking about, uh, we, have, we have lots of contacts, we were actually thinking about similar lines. Uh, but, but I wanted to use uh, uh, membranes, so semipermeable capsules. And uh, so the technology that we developed uh, in the last three years is called BioPC, Biomolecular Implementation of Protocellular Communication. And it actually combines these two ideas. So uh, uh, our protocells consist of a membrane, yes, we do. they have a membrane, but instead of using this usually complicated uh, cell lysate, which contains, I think, over 80 or 90 different components, 
uh, we just want to use DNA, interactions between DNA strands. It's extremely simple, it's extremely programmable, and it's also very scalable. Uh, so some of these uh, DNA-based networks that are now out of the literature are now have, you know, are, have approximately 150 unique DNA strands. So, so this is how large these networks can be. Uh, so the idea is what we have is we have uh, these protocells. So I give them here the semipermeable. Uh, so protocells are basically called these capsules with this, with this uh, semipermeable membrane. I call them protocells. And then they have an internalized DNA gate. And I will explain in a minute what a DNA gate is. But what this DNA gate does, it can sense a DNA strand. And based on the DNA strand that it sensed, it can secrete the DNA strand. And basically a one-to-one -one transformation. We also have catalytic variants, um, and I'll explain you in detail. So what we did with this platform, and, and this is what I will show you, um, is we could actually develop a, a very large, um, 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 a very broad spectrum of different pr uh, communication protocols. So I will show you, we can do simple transduction detection, cascading. Uh, I will show you some experiments where we also did signal integration by Boolean logic um, and also feedback. Uh, and just to make sure that we're on the same page, uh, it's quite, quite important to explain what this reaction is. Uh, so this reac reaction is what we call total mediated strand displacement. So in uh, total mediated strand displacement, uh, you have two input, you actually have two uh, reactants, what we call them. You have an input and this gate. Uh, this gate is a partial duplex, so ha it has a free uh, toll hold here. And the input ha actually has a, uh, a complementary part here. It can bind to this toll hold. You get this complex. And then via branch migration, this incoherent strand is kicked out. So, so this is the whole idea, uh, and, and you can make catalytic version of this. You can actually make ver you can make boolean type of uh, architectures with this. Uh, but this is the core uh, the core reaction that we use. Um, so when we started, we thought, okay, cool liposomes. Uh, so, so I had some experience with liposomes, but it actually turned out uh, uh, quite fast that uh, liposomes and DNA uh, they actually don't mix. So uh, liposomes are, are extremely impermeable for uh, DNA strands, for single stranded DNA strands. You can go maybe below 10 base pairs. Um, a, a DNA strand can actually cross the liposome membrane, uh, but, but that's it. So we quickly uh, actually ditched it. And uh, then one of my students, um, I actually came in contact with Stephen Mann. He's at the University of Bristol. And uh, Steve has all kinds of different microcapsules. So he has like his whole library of microcapsules that are not only made from liposomes or so from lipids, but he makes uh, microcapsules actually based on anything, clay, uh, inorganic materials, but also proteins. And um, I sent actually my student there and we decided just to test a couple of his uh, microcapsules to see which ones are permeable for, uh, for single stranded DNA. And the one we actually found quite rapidly are proteinosomes. And, and what are proteinosomes? Uh, proteinosomes are microcapsules based on uh, protein polymer conjugates. Uh, so what you have is you have, uh, uh, we, we use BSA, it's very cheap, bovine serum album. Uh, it's very cheap. You can actually react it with an apolar, um, with an apolar polymer. And you get this amplifile. You then dissolve it in water and you add oil, you shake. And then you get these microcapsules. Uh, these microcapsules are not very stable. So in order to stabilize them, uh, we cross-link them with a uh, chemical, with a cross-linking agent. Um, we call this a bis nhs ester. So it basically cross-links the amines that are present on the BSA. Uh, you can then do dialysis, and then you add up with this, you, you then end up with these uh, microcapsules uh, in water. And so they are stable in water. Um, so what we did is we, because we want to, um, what is very important in our technology is that this, uh, these DNA gates are actually um, encapsulated, localized within these uh, microcapsules. So, so they shouldn't diffuse out. So what we thought is, okay, suppose we could add, uh, in this procedure, we could add streptavidin. You can buy biotinylated DNA. You can just order it from, uh, from uh, any, uh, any company. And suppose, you know, 
if the membrane is, uh, is not permeable for streptavidin, but it is permeable for, for DNA, uh, then maybe the DNA can go in and it will be stuck there. And so that was actually our initial guess. So we adapted the protocol a bit so that we can actually end up with uh, um, these protein genomes that, that contain these encapsulated streptavidin. And this is actually the first experiment we did. Uh, back in 2017, yeah, 2017. Um, so we, we actually made this proteinosome with this internalized uh, streptavidin. Uh, you can visualize them. So here is the FITSI channel. So what we have is we have this, uh, this BSA. We have that uh, labeled with FITSI. It's a dye, it's a green dye. Uh, we look at uh, with uh, confocal and you indeed see here, you see the membrane. Uh, you also see there are some conjugate inside right? so so it's not completely if it's, this is confocal if it was really if there was nothing uh, only water on the inside you would not see uh, it would basically be dark but we also did some frop experiments and from this we concluded that the internal uh, the internal compartment is, is very liquid like if you now add the um, the biotin related dna uh, it actually goes in so we, we labeled the biotin related dna with uh, side five uh, it actually goes in uh, you see here red, so red is side five. Uh, we wash away the excess DNA, um, and that and that is stable for weeks and months. So once so once the uh, the biotin DNA goes in, it binds to the streptavidin, and it, it can no longer go out. And th this is basically the core idea. Um, like I said, the localization is stable not only for weeks, it's stable for months. It, the the uh, streptavidin DNA complex does not leak out. Uh, and we've now managed to do this for single-stranded DNA as large as 200 base pairs. That's really the maximum. Uh, it, it seems there's not a really sharp cutoff, but even with 200 base pairs, it takes us almost like five or six hours of equilibration before all the DNA is in. Well, for the shortest strands, like 20 base pairs, it really goes almost immediately. Okay, so, you know, our next idea was, let's see we, when we can do a strand displacement. So we have this strand displacement gate, we encapsulate it into the proteasome. Um, it has a quencher here, and it has a fluorophore. Uh, this is side five. So when the DNA gate is not activated, uh, it is dark. Uh, but when there's a strand displacement reaction and the input, the quencher is kicked out and you get fluorescence. Um, and then, of course, we add, these, we add this uh, input from the outside. That's so, so that is the idea. Uh, so we tried this a couple of times uh, on a glass slide, a very primitive setup. It kind of worked, but we, we found out very, very rapidly that the, uh, the kinetics are very fast. And so what we we actually spent quite some time in developing a uh, microfluidic droplet trap. So what is microfluidic droplet trap is it traps these protocells in a large array. And it allows us to add the input uh, via pressurized valves. Uh, so probably, I think you saw the Jeff Hasty talk as well, or not? Yeah, so he also used this valve-based technology uh, quite a lot. Uh, so with this valve-based technology, we can actually uh, uh, open the valves at the input in this case, this DNA. And then we can uh, measure uh, the fluorescence of each individual uh, uh, protocell in time. What I forgot to tell you, um, and that's a little bit important, the way we prepare them, um, very defined this emulsion method, uh, what you actually get are very polydispersed uh, protocells. Uh, so they're typically uh, between 10 and 40 micrometer in size. Uh, and they have a, uh, also a distribution of internalized trapped evidence. Um, we have developed a method now using microfidics that allows us to make uh, uh, really more dispersed. But everything you see in this lecture is based on these polydispersed uh, poly samples. So we also characterize this polydispersity uh, on the trap. Right, so what you see here is the size distribution on the trap on the left. Right, so particles are between 20 and, and 40 micrometer. And um, the streptavidin concentration, internalized streptavidin. So we labeled the streptavidin, uh, we labeled the streptavidin uh, with a yellow dye. 
And uh, you also see there's a distribution of concentrations assigned. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's look at the results of this uh, uh, strand displacement. And you see it here. This is one of the really earliest movies that we take. Uh, I will show you much better ones uh, during the lecture. But what you do see is um, after we add this input, you actually start to see that these uh, protocells cells uh, become uh, red. You can also, also follow the fluorescence. So here we converted the fluorescence to the concentration of activated probe. So we made a, a, um, uh, we make a, a calibration graph. Um, and uh, so what you see is that the, uh, this is the average. So we, we can follow actually each individual protocell in time. And what you see here is the average, and this is the standard deviation. And the standard deviation uh, is basically caused by some simulations. It's basically caused by the fact that they have a distribution of, uh, of trapped evidence. Um, like I said, so one of the advantages of using uh, protein cells instead of beat is, is that you can actually can control this. Um, you can actually control the permeability. And that's what we did in this experiment. Uh, so we prepare these particles, we prepare these capsules using a crosslinker. And we can actually chemical tune this, this, uh, this crosslinker. So on the, in the experiments that I've showed you, we've used a crosslinker uh, that was very hydrophobic. But we also prepared a protocell uh, with a uh, very hydrophilic crosslinker. And we can actually do the same experiments. And, and you see that it is very different. And so here we get this exponential strand displacement kinetics. Uh, well, here you have a very linear strand displacement up until, let's say, 90% conversion, and then it starts to level off. So to understand why this, you know, what causes this, um, we uh, uh, looked at the um, uh, we've developed a very simple ODE model. Uh, it's a two-step ODE model. You have a uh, thick diffusion of the input into the, um, to the protocell. Uh, and it is uh, regulated by this constant P, the permeability. Uh, and then you have a mass action strand. You have a single reaction here. So bimolecular reaction, bimolecular reaction with a uh, strand displacement rate constant K. Um, and what we did is we actually fit all the curves uh, individually. And here you see all the curves on the left uh, that belong to this high permeable, oops, to, to these high permeable um, protocells. And here in blue you see the, all the curves that belong to the low permeable uh, protocells. Uh, and you see actually that this model, so what we do is for each of these individual curves we can actually get an estimate of the value of P and the value of K. We can then plot them and this is what you see here. So here we did it for the permeability constant on the left. This is the rate constant on the right. And just look at this, uh, uh, these two. And what you see is you see a large difference in permeability constant between these two sets of protocells, as expected, because we were actually making changes in the, uh, in the membrane. Uh, well, the rate constants are approximately the same. Uh, there's a little bit more spread here for the low permeable ones. Uh, but their, their average is, uh, is approximately the same. And so this indeed confirms that what is happening in these uh, protocells is that we can actually tune the kinetics uh, by, uh, by, by, by doing this memory in chemistry. Um, so next, uh, we went to uh, communication. Um, and um, here starts uh, a little bit sometimes to make it difficult, but I will try to explain it uh, carefully. Uh, so we have two populations, population one and population two. Population one can accept uh, this input strand A. It can bind to this toehold here, alpha. And then it can kick out Q1. As a result, because Q1 contains a quencher, uh, this uh, second population will become uh, red. And so it has a psi five die. So now Q1, that is secreted by this uh, first generation can uh, diffuse to the second generation. And um, it can diffuse in and kick out Q2. And then uh, Q2 also contains a quencher. Uh, so the second population will become yellow. So we have here a uh, Alexa 546 die. And then what we did here is an additional step. Uh, so what you then get is this uh, new toehold here. We added the so-called fuel. 
Um, and this fuel, um, this fuel strand can bind to this toll here and then regenerate Q1. So it's a kind of a, a catalytic mechanism to re regenerate uh, Q1. Um, and uh, yeah, what you would expect is then a much higher activation of the second uh, population. So here you see a movie. So I can start it again. This is slow. So what you see here is population one is in, in red. Population two is in yellow. And uh, what is very nice is that you can analyze each of these individual protocells. Uh, so here on the left, this graph, you have an experiment. Uh, so it contains approximately 20 of the first population and 23 of the first population, 19 of the second population. We add the input here, and then we can follow the evolution of the fluorescence, which is basically the activation of the two populations in time. And what you see is uh, you first see the appearance of the red population, and so there's population one, and only afterwards you see activation of the second population. And that's also what you expect again, because population two um, only can become activated based on the uh, secreted signal of population one. So what happens if we add fuel? If we add fuel, we expect that the second population will be activated much more. Right? So we are doing these experiments under conditions that actually this intermediate signal is, uh, is not an excess. Right? So, so there's, a, there's a limiting, um, uh, this, the, the production of this signal is limiting. Uh, so if we now add fuel, uh, we regenerate the signal to expect that uh, population two becomes uh, activated. And again, this is also what we see. So here now you see that population one is still activated in a similar way, but now population two is amplified. Uh, we also try to model this using a, a two-dimensional reaction diffusion simulations. Uh, this is together with Andrew and Neil from Microsoft Research. Uh, and I won't go into too much depth, uh, but what you do see is that qualitatively, uh, these two, you know, the experiment, but also the reaction diffusion simulations, they match quite well, quite well. So these are not fitted data, but we don't fit these experiments. We have just some guesses of this, uh, uh, this, this constants, these uh, kinetic constants and their permeability. And, and we already got a very good uh, description of the, uh, of the process. And so again, this is population one, this is population two. And we have also here incorporated already the, the uh, fuel driven regeneration. It's also incorporated. So this is very scalable. So this is a, a, a three population experiment. Uh, in this case, the, we use three different fuels because we regenerate the input, the signal one and the signal two. Um, and one of the difficulties is if you try to scale this to uh, an n number of uh, different populations, is that you need to use, so for two, place, two populations, I needed two different dyes. And so uh, Psi 5 Alexa, for three or four or five, this, this actually doesn't really work anymore uh, because you cannot get such large number of independent dyes. There's always overlap in the emission spectra. So what we did here is we did a different trick. We actually barcoded, uh, barcoded the particles. So we can uh, do membrane chemistry so we do, we can, uh, for example, we label the uh, population one with a green dye, we label population two with a, uh, a blue dye, and then we label population three with a mixture of uh, green and blue dye. So we get this cyan. Then we look at the trap. We immediately see, okay, this is population one. This is population, uh, this is population three. Uh, this is population two. Um, and that allow, actually allows us to follow this trend displacement reaction with a single uh, fluorophore, psi phi, because we now actually know uh, if you're looking at the trap, okay, you know, this one belongs to population one, this one belongs to population, oh, sorry, this one belongs to population one, this one belongs to population three, this one belongs to population three. Um, and then with three um, populations, what you see is you add input to the fuel and uh, you get a progressive um, amplification of the, of the signal. So this is the response of population one. 
responsive population two and is responsive population three. So next we wondered whether we could um, engineer bi-directional communication. Um, of course, like living systems do it all the time. Right? So, so signals are being sent to cells, but cells can also send signals back. Look at, for example, cytokine signaling. Um, so that's what we tried next. Uh, so we have two populations again, population one and population two. Uh, we now send the uh, input to population one. It can go in, bind to the toehold, kick out Q1. Q1 also contains a quencher. So Q1 now, because the quencher is kicked out, um, it becomes red. This Q1 can now go to population two, You're very similar as I've showed you in the, in the, in the cascade, it can go to population two, it can bind that to the toehold, and uh, it can kick out what we call this inhibitor strand. So it's called INH inhibitor. You can get this, you then get at this state. So population two becomes yellow. But now there's a slight difference between the previous experiment is that now the strand that is kicked out here now has an affinity for this newly exposed domain in uh, population one. So it can go, come in, bind to this domain, kick out A again, and because this one now also contains a quencher, it also it starts to quench the fluorescence again of the of the population one. We've also um, incorporated the shield driven uh, part into it, uh, just to show you how modular it is. Uh, so this this shield driven part, we can add the fuel, uh, and then you get a bigger response and amplification in uh, in the second population. Where you don't add the fuel, then it also works. But it's just you know we want to actually show how modular. Uh, this technology is. Uh, so these are the results. When I first saw this movie, I was really, I don't know, I really liked it. So in the beginning, you activate population one, it, it becomes uh, red. Then you see population two becoming activated. Population two sends actually back this signal with the quencher to population one. And then indeed what you see, it is quite a big point of dispersity also in the time constant by which these um, populations are actually uh, uh, dampened. Uh, and then in the end, you see that everything is uh, back to, uh, um, population one is completely quenched. So you can also follow it. This is what we did here. Um, and so this is just the average uh, activated concentration, activated gate concentrations inside these, uh, inside population one and population two. As you indeed see population one increases, population two increases, but then population one starts to decrease again. Um, how long do I still have? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the nice things about these strand displacement reactions is that uh, you, cannot only, you can also use them to do much more complex uh, molecular transformations, for example, Boolean logic. Uh, so what we did in this experiment, uh, we, uh, uh, what we, we call it a distributed sensing and signal integration experiment. Uh, so we have uh, three different uh, protocells. Uh, we we'll call it the sensor populations a and B, they can be activated. And as a result, they start to release a signal, in this case, signal A and signal B. And these signals are actually combined at a um, protocell that contains a uh, Boolean gate. And this Boolean gate can either be an AND gate or an OR gate. Um, so what we do is we prepare these, uh, these uh, populations in the trap. Uh, we have some control not too much, we have some control about the fraction of each population that is present. So in this case, we have uh, uh, the fractions of A and B are approximately 0 0.45, and we have approximately 0 0.1 a fraction of, uh, of the Boolean gate. So we then add uh, input A and input B, uh, and only when we add, for the AND gate, only when we add input A and input B, 
um, do we see the, so what you see here in this graph is the signal from the Boolean uh, protocell, from the Boolean protocells. Uh, I, don't, I didn't plot the, uh, the error bars here, but, but we have data that, uh, in, which it, in which we do plot it. Uh, but what you see is only when you add uh, A and B, only on that condition, the AND gate becomes activated. For the OR gate, um, we, can either, we can add either input A or input B, um, and, or, or both, and the OR gate becomes activated. So here again, you see the activation of the uh, Boolean proto cells over time. Uh, we can also serial, serial connect them. Uh, so you can actually connect a OR to an AND gate. Um, so this is an experiment where we had a OR gate uh, connected to an AND gate. Uh, so the OR gate protocells, they can be activated by input B or input C. They then release a strand that we call B or C. And another input that we add is the input A. And uh, this one input belongs to the AND gate. Uh, and what you see here is the response of the AND gate. Uh, protocells and, uh, and you actually see that, 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 that you get the expected uh, truth table back. I will skip this for the time being, uh, but let's move to, uh, to another part in the remaining uh, that I have. Um, so one of the things if you look at natural systems is that nature uses what, what is called sender receiver uh, topologies. So senders are actually specialized cells that secrete a certain molecule and uh, receivers uh, can accept this. Receiver cells can actually accept this, uh, um, uh, this molecule, this, this signal. And uh, this is very profound to our nature. I think the best well-suited examples are of course morphogen signaling. Um, so you have uh, morphogens that are secreted from these specialized sender cells. Uh, resulting in a morphogen uh, uh, gradient that uh, directs gene, gene expression of nearby cells. Uh, but actually, recent results have also shown that it happens in many more different biological systems. For example, in cytokine signaling, uh, so it's basically immune system. Uh, and so cytokine signaling in the lymph node also shows all the characteristics of a sender receiver. So we have specialized immune cells that secrete uh, uh, interleukin-2 and you actually have specialized immune cells that uh, um, um, take up this interleukin-2. What's very interesting to see is that, uh, um, of course, what you expect, because there's a gradient involved, there's a kind of effective uh, length scale involved. And uh, for many of these uh, natural systems, this, this length scale is between 50 and 500 micrometer. Um, so we thought about that and said, okay, that, that's really cool. But the system that we have now is not really suited for that because we don't really have a control over where, um, we don't have a control over sender activation. So let me explain you that. So in, in the current system that we have, so, so here now I've used sender and receivers. Uh, so I use the symbols for the sender and this for the receiver. So we have here a population, let's say on the trap, and we have uh, uh, here all the receivers and there are two senders. So, what we would have done with the BioPC platform is we would flow in the input for the sender. Um, and that input doesn't discriminate between these two different senders. So we don't really have a spatial control. Both of these two senders would be activated in the current system. So what we wanted to develop is a system where uh, we can spatially control where this um, sender activation uh, occurs. So we actually want to spatially control where uh, the sender starts to secrete uh, the messenger. Uh, so we did this uh, using light. So this work will appear in HCS Nano very soon. It was um, accepted a couple of days ago. Um, so what we, um, we developed a light sensitive system. So we developed light sensitive uh, sender cells. Um, and it's actually very simple. Um, you can actually buy from uh, these commercial DNA vendors, you can buy a uh, DNA strands that have a photo cleavable linker. Um, so what we do is we prepare a sender protocell uh, with a DNA gate, internalized DNA gate with such a photo cleavable linker. So the melted temperature of this complex is far above the melted the temperature that we do the experiments. So 
this will not dis dissociate. It will just be stuck there. So then we come with a laser. So it's a 405 laser. We shine light on this. We break the photocleavable linker. And then we get two smaller fragments. But the melting temperature of each of these fragments is now uh, below the temperature at which we performed the experiment. So they will start to dissociate and uh, they, are, they will be secreted from the, uh, uh, from the sender of the cell. They then go, can go, they can diffuse over in the surrounding and they can start to activate uh, nearby receivers via this strand displacement mechanism. Uh, in order to um, um, study this, we again use two, two different types of uh, uh, fluorescent dyes. So we have, uh, we can follow receiver activation. Oh yeah, here, follow receiver activation using this red dye. So in the state that the sender is not, sorry, sender activation using a red dye. So if the, in case the sender is not activated, it has this quencher very close to the side five. As soon as we shine light on it and break this photocleavable linker, uh, this quencher will dissociate, so it will become red. So the uh, sender, once becomes activated, it will become red. For the receivers, we again use a yellow dye. If receivers become activated, so there's a quencher here, uh, but if the signal from the sender displaces the, uh, the activates the receiver, it will become uh, yellow. So I will now show you a movie um, where we uh, did this. I will explain the colors in a bit. What you indeed see here in the beginning, you see that slowly over time and space, these uh, protocells become activated. So the reason that you see a red color here is uh, we just plotted this as an intensity value of red, so the, the, uh, the, the sender is here. Um, I will show you some real, so this is really data from the microscope. Uh, so in this case, uh, we, we can again look at the, um, the protocells, they are labeled with the Spitzy dye. Uh, then we start to irradiate, so the, receive, the sender is here, we start to irradiate the sender with uh, light. It starts to become red, and over time the receivers start to become activated. So this process is very well spatially controlled. So we have experiments where we have we place an identical sender at this position. Uh, if we then shine light here, we only see activation of this sender, not of the nearby uh, sender. So it has a very uh, good spatial resolution. But that's I mean, it's also what you expect because these laser beams are not like really large. Uh, so how do we follow these experiments? Um, we uh, uh, use some image analysis software. We, so here's the sender. What we then do is we bin the nearby receivers in different shells and all these different shells are, uh, they contain receivers that have are approximately the same distance to the sender. And so we have a, a shell here, and we have a shell here, we have a shell here. And then we can actually plot the average uh, fluorescence con the fluorescence signal or the activated gate concentration. We can again compute that from the, uh, some of the calibration experiments um, as a function of time. And so we keep irradiating these uh, uh, the sender. So we, we under the condition that we do the experiments, we irradiate the sender. There's you know there's a constant flux of uh, uh, of uh, uh, signal that is released from the sender. Uh, and what you then see is that uh, the receivers start to respond. And the response of the receivers is dependent on the, the distance from the sender. And so you see here that shell one, shell two, and shell three, uh, they are becoming activated. Uh, but then uh, the other shells, so further away, uh, are not activated at all. And that's also, you know, if you think about it, it's, uh, it's not strange because these uh, protocells, they consume the signal that is released from the, uh, uh, from the sender cell. And so at a certain point, all the signal is consumed and you know, the, the, the outer layer of uh, receivers are not, uh, are not being activated anymore. Uh, one of the nice things is that we can also compute now this length scale, the characteristic length scale. Um, so what we did is we, we plotted here uh, the activation front as a function of the distance to the center and the time. 
Um, it's a bit complicated graph. We extrapolate it. So these are normally these are individual data points. We extrapolate it just to uh, for visualization purposes. But what you do see is that around time is let's say 80 minutes, 90 minutes, you're in a kind of pseudo steady state. And so the central sender is still emitting uh, a signal, but the front is not really propagating anymore. Um, and from that, yeah, from that distance, so here uh, is from two hours, uh, let's say two hours, so it's here. Uh, we then get the profile, which you see here. So here you see the initial, we fit it with a diffusion equation. And from that, we get a uh, length scale. And this length scale for this particular experiment is around 225 micrometer, which is you know, very much in the ballpark as real cells. And it's also not surprising, but because these protocells are actually very much similar in size to real cells. Uh, what is very cool about biology is biology, of course, understands how important such a signaling length scale is. Uh, so it has, find, it has found all kinds of, uh, uh, I will try to finish uh, in a bit. So it has, tried, uh, it has tried to find all kinds of different ways to control this length scale. Uh, and one of the ways it can control this length scales, for example, by uh, degrading the, uh, the diffusing signal. Uh, so here, what you see here is a simulation of a reaction diffusion equation. Uh, when there's just a, um, a cells that, here that emit the signal uh, with a constant flux. And you see actually the length scale is infinite. So it will start to diffuse, diffuse. There's no, as long as there's, um, there's this flux, there's this um, uh, production of this signal here, this position, um, it will spread. However, if you now add linear degradation, you see that actually the length scale of the diffusion becomes finite. Um, I don't really have a lot of time anymore, uh, but what is really cool is that uh, we can actually vary a, a whole different set of parameters in this, uh, in, this, uh, um, in this system. We can, for example, look at the internalized concentration of DNA gates inside these uh, um, receivers. So the more capacity the receivers are have, the lower this length scale, of course, will be, uh, because they just start to consume much more um, of the signal. We, we looked at membrane permeability. The higher membrane permeability, the more for the receivers, the more signal comes in, the more, and, and, and as a result, this length scale becomes uh, smaller. We looked at receiver, we, we varied the density, but using different uh, microfluidic uh, micro traps. We even added um, external signal degradation using an action nuclease. Uh, and it also gives the expected, uh, uh, the expected uh, results. So if you add this action nuclease, uh, your length scale actually becomes smaller. Um, and uh, we looked at signal amplification. And of course, when you add signal amplification, your length scale will go up. Right? Then, then it will just reach much further. Finally, and, and, and uh, then I will stop. Um, we were also curious if you could actually uh, engineer a spatial uh, AND gate, spatial Boolean gate. So what we did in this experiment, we had two um, sender protocells that are basically embedded in a sea of end gates. We then activate these non-identical sender cells with light. Uh, and what you expect for an end gate, uh, for end gate uh, is that this signal initiation will start here somewhere in the middle. Um, and that's also exactly what we, uh, what we see. We see it here. So these are the two senders. And you can actually analyze, and this, was, this is the last slide, you can actually start to analyze this again by, by binning uh, all the protocells. And then what you see here is, is you clearly see that protocells that are in the middle of its two senders are initiated first. Um, actually, this is it. Um, I would like to thank, uh, that this is my group. Uh, like I said, I'm very happy to be supported by an ESC grant. Uh, but also by uh, other funding uh, agencies. Uh, much of the work was done by uh, Alex, Paz, and Sho. These are PhD students in my group with collaborations from um, other people from the University of Bristol and Microsoft Research. And we'll be very happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tom. Amazing what you completed. <laughs> um, so maybe we can start. So I see first question by Manish. Can you get us started here, Manish? Yeah, I was just curious, um, is the diffusion rate of the single-stranded DNA molecules into and out of these capsules of different permeability different, or are the rates similar in both directions? 
And is there a way you're thinking about that you could control these permeabilities on the fly or change the permeabilities during the experiment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have good evidence that the uh, the permeability from, from the outside to the inside is equal to the permeability from the outside, from the inside to the outside. Okay. So we did experiments where we basically added DNA strands from the inside, mm -hmm. from the outside, and then looked at just on a microscope, like how fast it fills up. Yeah. We have also done experiments with light, for example, where we cleave mm -hmm. it. And so then you know that the, that the gate is inside, we mm -hmm. cleave it. And then we looked at the depletion of the fluorescent signal of the increase in the fluorescent signal over time. And we get exactly the same. Uh, so there's no asymmetry in the permeability. Mm -hmm. The other question is very interesting. Uh, yeah, we were, I mean, I, I, there's endless possibilities, I think. Um, one of the cool things is, is people are working on, for example, now on DNA hydrogels. So these are hydrogels that consist uh, only from, that are only consist of DNA. Mm -hmm. And they can actually be triggered to gelate by a uh, DNA strand, by initiator strand. Uh, so we're also playing, of course, with the idea is that yeah, suppose you have uh, signaling um, and then, uh, you know, you signal to one of these protocells and this initiates this gelation reaction so that it becomes gel. We live now crazier things. I, I, I normally don't, uh, uh, yeah, I, I can just say that. So one of the things that we're also trying to do is a kind of a protocell apoptosis. Okay. Uh, where we... Um, try to reprogram the system in such a way that uh, if it gets a signal, that specific protocell will start to um, hydrolyze, basically cleave itself. Okay. It's also something that we are uh, doing. But this is being recorded, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would like to ask you a follow-up on that then. <laughs> how, how are you doing that? Is it proteinases that you're, you turned off and you, uh, do you cleave off these you know, the streptavidin itself, or are you cleaving off the linkers or chemically modifying them? Yeah, so, so, uh, yeah. Okay, maybe we don't do it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we did some very initial experiments. Uh, so we have actually, um, uh, I can show you. So my group also has uh, expertise on um, DNA induced activation of caspases. Uh, okay. So caspases outside of the cell. Uh, mm -hmm. So caspases are, um, uh, yeah, of course, uh, enzymes that are, that are um, uh, used during um, um, apoptosis itself. Mm -hmm. We actually found ways to actually activate this caspase using uh, uh, DNA signals. I see. So we actually now are trying to combine these two projects. Um, yeah. yeah. Very exciting. <laughs> okay, awesome. Then there was another question already posted earlier. Maybe I will reformulate it a bit. Um, what's the, the role of mathematical modeling in, in your work? Uh, same question for computer science, same question for theoretical computer science. Uh, yeah, this, this, uh, sometimes I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, so, so I hope maybe that you can answer those questions. But for modeling, um, I see a number of, um, I see a number of advantages. Uh, especially prototyping. Uh, so what we've seen now is that making these, these trend displacement, uh, these trend displacement networks bigger, scalable, making, making them larger, it's not an easy task. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, you have to go, you know, you order some DNAs, um, you try to do these trend displacement networks, but then you actually find out that, you know, this, DNA strand that you designed also has a very small interaction with this other DNA strand that it shouldn't normally be interacting with. And that sometimes completely messes up your, uh, the behavior of, of the circuits. So I think there, you know, modeling is extremely uh, helpful. So, you know, can we develop procedures uh, which we can design these very large uh, DNA based chemical reaction networks? Uh, taking into account, and that's, that's I think they're very much different from the these normal DNA strand displacement uh, networks. Uh, so there's there's lo there's co-localization here. So in our technology, some of these DNA gates they can never interact with each other, mm. and it is actually an advantage because it makes the the uh, the system much easier to design. 
Uh, so, so some of these very large networks, uh, so for example, Eric Winfrey had a, a paper in science on the oscillator and they had to do a couple of these uh, uh, design build test cycles because they keep finding, uh, and this network was quite large already. Uh, but here, what you can do is you can actually modular in a very modular way, uh, how can I say, like um, build different parts of the network inside a single inside a single protocell because you know that the gates that are in one protocell never interact with the gates in another protocell. So I think in terms of um, making this whole technology of this strand state interaction more modular, I think uh, this this localization is very nice. The other two, the other two. I don't know, theoretical computer science, I hope they can give me, I, you know, compute this. <laughs> gotcha. Maybe, so I see another question in the chat, but maybe short follow-up question. You said like to, to, to push the size of um, the complexity of the system, you, you would like to have those models and there you need them. How far do you want to push that? And, and what's kind of, do you have like an application mind? What's the, what's the end goal there? Yeah, I need hundreds. That's that's what I hope. So I, I just I'm gonna, for forty nine. <laughs> no, I I, I, I want to go for I want to go for hundreds. Uh, so I, I recently wrote my ESC consolidator, and, and uh, that was one of the major topics is the scalability. Um, we we think this is a very cool technology to do massively parallel processing of of uh, molecular information. Uh, so there are now lots of technologies are available where you can convert the presence of a biomolecule, either, um, for example, protein or, so we have a paper where we do it with antibodies. Mm -hmm. You can actually directly translate their presence into a DNA signal. And so uh, what I envision is a kind of technology uh, that can translate the presence of uh, biological molecules, proteins, Antibodies, microRNAs, it's easy because they, they, you know, microRNAs are very complementary to, RNA, to DNA. Uh, small molecules, convert them to uh, DNA strands, and then it gets processed in, these, uh, in, in this platform. So that's basically the central idea. Is that an in vitro application or in vivo that you have in mind? In, in vitro, uh, but I, I, I'm not laying any claims. Uh, what is pretty cool about this technology, I skipped that slide. So one of the drawbacks of the strand displacement reactions is that uh, if you want to do them, for example, in serum, without, without the particles, if you want to do them in serum, um, typically what we use is FBS, is fetal bovine serum, even at 10% FBS, your strand displacement reaction won't work anymore even after like 20 minutes. Because the nucleases that are present in these uh, um, in in this in this medium completely shreds them to part. So we did some adaptations to this uh, BioPC platform, making the, the membrane a little bit dif different. And we can actually now store these particles with these internalized DNA gates for 24 hours in serum, um, and then perform a strand displacement reaction in serum. Oh well. I, I don't say that we will go to, you know, this will be in the human body. Uh, it's too much science fiction, I think. Uh, but what we, we did show that, you know, there's compatibility with, with biological relevant uh, media. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, there's another question. Corbin, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Sure. So if I remember right, when you were showing the OR gate, the signal with both inputs active was weaker than with either active. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So, of course, it's, it, it's, oh, I see. It's still stronger than the one zero. Yeah. Oh, okay, be, yeah. You have to be careful here is that uh, these are three separate experiments. Um, and we, it's not always easy to control the number. Uh, you know, this is quite a random process. The way we have um, these, these multimodal cell, cell uh, experiments is we just add first one, then the second one, then the third one. It's very stochastic. So actually, one of the things I think would help enormously is to find a way in which we can actually position these different protocells uh, with some may, may, something, for example, ma magnetic or I don't know something else. So it's a, now it's completely random, uh, which makes these experiments very difficult to do uh, because you rely on stochastic, like stochastic trapping of different populations. So that's something that uh, that, that would be very cool if you could develop that. For sure. Thank you.
I think there was an, another question by Manish, if you ask um, it. Yeah, I'm just curious about how you design the, uh, the sequence of the DNA itself. Are you looking at, uh, you know, minimum free energy interaction uh, numbers, or are you also looking at the kinetics of strand displacement? Uh, when you no, we, we, most, we mostly looked at the, uh, of course, complementarity, mm -hmm. so, so, so melting temperature. Yeah. Uh, um, the kinetics you actually control with the length of the toe hold. Okay. Um, so that, that's very easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do, we do several tests. We, for example, look at if the, the, if the, the strands don't form any secondary structure. Mm -hmm. That's, of course, very important. Yeah. Um, and if there are no, if the, you know, if there's no um, non-ideal interactions between different strands, mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you want to have input A hybridized to DNA gate A, mm -hmm. then, then there shouldn't be a very large sequence similarity with input A yes. and, uh, for example, DNA gate uh, B. Because yeah. if that's there, then that will interfere. Yeah. But again, like, I, if you want to scale this up, mm -hmm. uh, we need to, out there are already some tools that can do this for you. So, so there's a so NUPAC has the option to uh, look at interactions between a, a very large uh, com uh, calculate basically the, the all the different complexes that can form. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, these softwares are made for um, systems that are just homogeneously dissolved, and where and, and so that's different here. Then maybe let's let's uh, thanks so much, Tom. Uh, yeah. and, um, uh, we we make the changeover to the next speaker. Um, it, it was really really inspiring what you what you told us. Very very. Thank you very cool. much. Thank you.